Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to Sierra Camp's webinar, California Forest and Climate Policy and What It Means for the Sierra. Um, thank you for being with us today. My name is Diana Madsen. I am the director of Sierra Camp. So we're going to go ahead and get started. A few housekeeping items before we begin. Everybody is automatically muted. But if you are interested in asking a question or, or providing a comment during the Q&A portion at the end or for clarification questions throughout the presentation, you can type a question into the question box in the GoToWebinar window on the right. You can also, if you want to ask um, over audio, you could raise your hand using the raise your hand icon. That is the little hand mark that you can see in the image here. If you have any trouble connecting, visit um, help.citrix.com forward slash meeting forward slash join help and they can talk you through any tech issues. Then lastly, we'll be sending out slides and a recording following the webinar. All right. So today we're going to start, I'm going to provide a brief intro to Sierra Camp, the Climate Adaptation and Mitigation Partnership hosted at Sierra Business Council. Then I'll turn it over to Brandon Collins with the U.S. Forest Service and UC Berkeley to provide a Forest Health 101 overview. Next, George Gentry with the California Forestry Association will speak to California forest policies and climate policies in the overlap there. Um, and then finally, we'll have Sierra um, Sierra Camp Forest and Climate Policy Priority Overview, so what we're focusing on in the next year, and that will be led by Carrie Kimmer, um, who is a steering committee member with Sierra Camp and also the Government Affairs Director for Sierra Business Council. We'll close with open Q&A, inviting your questions and comments, um, again, through the, the question function in the chat box or raising your hand. We will have clarification questions throughout. I recommend, um, in that case, we'll be posing that for, um, you can ask those in the question box, but then we'll be doing audio questions at the end as well. The Sierra Camp, the Climate Adaptation and Mitigation Partnership, is a membership-based partner, membership partnership of Sierra organizations, businesses, and local governments working together to promote climate adaptation and mitigation strategies across the Sierra. We're very much interested in increasing investment from state funding sources and private funding sources into the Sierra region in order to promote these strategies. We have two main activities or, or strategies for which we pursue our goal of promoting climate strategies in the region. One is to inform empower and mobilize Sierra leaders on California climate policy. So that includes do hosting webinars such as this, as well as leading events in the region and working on policy advocacy through comment letters and other organizations. We also, our second key strategy is to build an understanding for support and investment from urban California. We're starting to get the coastal communities in Sacramento that are the, the main population centers in our state to begin thinking about how their, the natural resources they rely on that come from the Sierra are part of their climate strategy. So we get them to be um, incorporating and thinking about and advocating for investment in those natural resources in the Sierra. Well, uh, my contact information will be at the slide at the end. I very much welcome any questions or if you're looking for more information about Sierra Camp. Um, please do reach out to us. And here is a snapshot of our Sierra Camp's current membership um, across a number of different state, federal, local government agencies, as well as nonprofits and um, businesses in the region. So with that, I'm going to introduce Brandon Collins to jump into our Forest Health 101. Brandon is a research science with both scientists with both the Forest Service, um, Pacific Southwest Research Station, and the UC Berkeley Center for Fire Research and Outreach. He has a BS in forestry from UC Berkeley and an MS in forest science from Colorado State University and a PhD in wildland fire science from UC Berkeley. His research interests involve investigating effects of fire and fuels treatments on forests. And much of his research is intended to inform forest management efforts aimed at 
improving resiliency to wildfire and drought. So with that, I'm going to turn over presenter controls to Brandon. All right, thank you, Diana. Um, so, I've sort of um, been asked to talk broadly about forest health um, um, in, in Sierra and forests, and given my background um, and my research interests, it, it, I tend to focus on fire. Um, in you know, but there's going to be um, application to other aspects of forest health and in particular um, some of the tree mortality that we've been seeing um, over the last couple of years and probably most noticeable um, this year um, in, the, in the central and southern Sierra Nevada. They actually, um, the tree mortality and the, the fire piece are quite linked um, and, and the main link there is just the amount of change um, that our forests ha have experienced um, relative to sort of historical conditions, um, and I'll I'll get into that and what what the implications of that are. But I want to start out um, just talking uh, briefly about uh, about fire and some of the characteristics of fire um, that we tend to um, to use um, in our. Um, and in, in trying try to distinguish fire effects, I think a lot of people um, think about fire. People that don't, you know, intimately work with fire think about fire sort of as what you see on this slide. Um, and and I put it there on purpose in that it sort of captures a lot of the things that we, um, you know, or don't like about fire. We see trees, um, particularly large trees that are that are torching. Um, and it, you know, generally is that that sense of sort of destruction, if you will, um, that that you know we tend to um, associate with fire in our forests. But one of the things I want to convey um, is that there's a lot of fires have a range of effects, um, and those those have different implications down the line on on in terms of what happens after fire. So I'll. Um, like I said, this is going to be kind of focused on on fire um, because that's that's my background. But I but I will keep it broad. Um, um, you'll see in a little bit. But uh, from the get go, I want to start out with with some fire terminology. So first off, um, I, this notion of of different fire severity levels. Um, a lot of times, you know, you might hear that term high severity, and this is what the, what's shown on, on this slide is is what is meant there. Um, high severity is generally um, where most or all of the overstory trees have been killed by fire. And I think a lot of people that don't, again, that don't really experience fire or, or work around it probably think that that's what, you know, it is. Either when fire happens, it's, it looks like that or it doesn't burn. Well, in fact, um, you know, that's only one, one part of it. Um, there can be a full gradient, um, but we generally tend to put these in these classes just um, for simplicity. So there's high severity and then what this slide is showing is moderate severity, um, and that's where you might have some some overstory uh, mortality. That is, some of the large trees in, in the stand um, killed by the fire, but then also some trees still survive it. Um, and then, as you can imagine, at the far end of the, uh, the lower end of the spectrum, there's low severity, where you you basically don't kill any trees except for those in the understory, maybe the small trees, and then you kill, um, you know, you. You um, tend to uh, kill the lower branches on some of the large trees, um, which essentially kind of prunes the trees, if you will. But if you just if you think about it, um, that you just that every fire has some range of those effects. And I think what we what we um, are most concerned about is, is this is the high severity effects um, because of what what that. Um, you know what the impacts are to the forest um, for the next, you know, 10, 20, up to 100 years in terms of um, what vegetation comes back um, and then what services, if you think about it that way, what services the the forest provide. But again, just keep that in mind that every fire has this range of effects. It's not really a binary system in that it's not just either burned or unburned. It's really how did it burn. So the so a lot of times we focus on the patterns of fires and 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 we want to talk about how they burn. 
here's an example. So the the Rim fire. I think a lot of people probably know this fire pretty well, although there's been some other fires that have sort of come, you know, to that that scale um, in recent years. But but the Rim fire still stands alone. Um, it just in its sheer size, it was 250, almost 260,000 acres. Um, it burned. It started on the Stanislaus National Forest and burned in Yosemite. And what you see um, in this map, and it's in those three categories, that low, moderate, and high severity, you can see that sort of typed out. You can see that the entire fire is not all high severity. Um, there's actually quite a bit of, of the fire um, that burned at low severity and a smaller percentage that burned um, at, at what we call moderate severity. The concern um, from just a land management standpoint and from you know just thinking about forests into the future is where we have you know high severity and and the high severity at the scale that it happened in this um, in this fire now if you ever just look at this map and you didn't it didn't have a scale bar on the bottom you could say okay yeah there's you know it looks like there's a mix of effects what's the big deal well the big deal is to keep in mind this is 250,000 acres or, um, or slightly bigger and those big patches of red in the middle those are tens of thousands of acres where there's not a single live tree so looking at, at this picture this is what some of those areas look like um, when you're right in the middle of one of those big red patches that, that not a single live tree um, for you know in some cases multiple sub watersheds again tens of thousands of acres but if you go back up to this first picture there are plenty of areas um, you know there's almost probably a hundred and fifty thousand it depends hundred to hundred fifty thousand acres that actually you know burn reasonably um, reasonably low severity and in some cases even had desirable effects and desirable in that the the fire didn't kill a lot of the, the overstory trees but it, it did kill some of the trees in the understory and it reduced some of the surface fuels so I just um, I want to want to again reemphasize that point about this range of severity but the biggest thing that we're concerned about are these large patches of high high severity some of you may know the King fire um, that happened the uh, the following summer in 2014 um, and the concern here was this giant red patch in the middle of of the fire the f overall fire was about close to a hundred thousand acres but that that patch in the middle, that patch of red, um, is looks like this picture basically um, for tens of thousands of acres. I mean, that that patch alone, if you look at that one just in the middle, it's it's on the order of, you know, thirty thousand acres or something like that, where there's you know just complete um, overstory mortality, and it it's a, a major concern. I mean, that these fires are um, are not burning. At anything close to what they were, would have burned um, like historically, what they did burn like historically, there was no, there's no evidence of large patches of mortality at this kind of scale, um, and anywhere across the Sierras, um, from um, you know during uh, under historical conditions. And I'll get into why in a little bit, but just keep that in mind. That's our biggest concern when it comes to fire: these large patches of high mortality. One of the things. Associated with those large patches of mortality, obviously the tree component is removed. Those trees are um, are killed. They're not coming back. They don't re-sprout. Um, they what they you know in order to um, for the forest to regenerate, they, uh, they rely it relies on seeds from um, from adjacent areas outside of those um, those large patches to then fill into the patch, establish, and then sort of start. Um, you know, regenerating it into the new forest. The problem is in the Sierras, um, and it's not true everywhere, every single fire, but but by and large, these large patches of high severity um, can turn out to be shrub fields like this, um, which really can um, can change the dynamic um, of the the, um, the vegetation, the wildlife, um, and then you know what you know you can think of a suite of other things um, carbon um, being one of them you could think about just the, there's almost an order or two of magnitude change in the the level of carbon on site um, following some of these um, large stand replacing fires if you can think about it shrubs can't hold nearly the amount of carbon um, as, as an intact mature um, forest can um, so anyway lots of implications not just the immediate effect of seeing black but just a a really wholesale um, change in vegetation in, in these large um, um, high severity patches.
Okay, so you might say, okay, those are a few, you know, kind of extreme examples that you pulled uh, the Rim Fire and and the King Fire, and that's true. Um, they are, um, they're, you know, they're individual fire events. But what seems to be happening, what what is seemingly going on here is that we're seeing uh, an increase um, in the proportion um, of high severity uh, fire that is, you know, burning throughout the Sierras. Um, and this is these slides, uh, these these two graphs. The upper one is showing the the total um, area burned at high severity, and the lower is showing the proportion of area burned at high severity. And both, um, although it's messy, you can see every year there's sort of ups and downs, ups and downs. But if you draw a trend line through both of those, they're they're statistically significantly increasing, um, and that's a major concern. So that kind of you know that, that suggests that these are not just these large events like the Rim Fire and then the King Fire. They're not just kind of one-offs. Um, they're part of a, a larger trend um, that's going on. And in fact, um, when this this study was put out, it didn't even include uh, the Rim Fire. I think the data here stopped at 2010. So if you were to add the Rim Fire, add the King Fire, add the Rough Fire from last summer, that trend is is increasing. If not, it increased even faster um, now than it than maybe um, previously um, shown with the data only up to 2010. So this is a major concern um, for a lot of a lot of different um, reasons. And and so this is where you're sort of getting at the well, why 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 is it increasing? Um, what what's what's sort of feed into this? And um, you know, one of the there's two parts to it. Um, the first part of it is is very much related to, to forest change. Um, and it's really difficult to sort of um, to imagine how different um, forests were um, historically. And when I mean historically, we we are generally talking about the period prior to um, sort of uh, fire suppression and fire exclusion policies. In a lot of places in the Sierras, we sort of put that year put put it around 1900 is when those. You know, we really started getting systematic um, and and um, pretty intensive um, fire suppression and, and fire exclusion um, in the Sierras. Although that can change, it changes depending on where, you know, how areas were settled and um, and how remote you're, you're talking about it. So fire suppression, fire exclusion, huge piece of it. Timber harvesting is another piece of it, um, and it's not it's not the fact that anything was harvested; it's the way that it was harvested. Um, there were two sort of modes that were particularly um, problematic from sort of a forest development standpoint and, and, and um, that sort of have led us to where we are now. One being, you know, sort of this uh, these large areas that were clear cut um, and then sort of walked away from. The problem, you know, is if, you know, you, you take all the large trees off the site, you take, well, the majority of the trees off the site, and you can see like in this picture right here, there's a few trees left on site. They're not, um, you know, by any means um, high quality um, specimens, if you will. But what happens is there's, you know, you've sort of created this this um, this condition that's sort of a, a, a free for all um, when it comes to the next, you know, um, crop of, of trees and even shrubs. So essentially, there's, you know, there's a ton of of regeneration that went on um, following these types of harvests, and then you know there is also um, no real differentiation in the trees. They all are coming up at once, um, and and now you know by now a hundred years later, um, following you know a clear cut like this, and then even um, uh, fire um, suppression on top of that, there's been no um, thinning out of the stand at all. So it's just all the trees that could occupy that site, and now there's you know, essentially 100% of the growing space occupied, um, resulting in some of the, the fuels problems that we have. Um, the other part of the harvesting that was, you know, problematic and, and for similar reasons, frankly, um, was another was overstory removal. Um, so not all the harvesting was clear cut. Um, I don't have a good handle on how much um, of the of the Sierras may have been clear cut. Um, a lot of it tended to be associated with with railroad um, lines. But even other areas that weren't clear cut, um, all the way up until the 50s, um, even the 1970s, um, there was a practice of sort of overstory removal, and that's that um, s similarly sort of opened up a lot of growing space 
um, when you take out the large trees and again you know sort of maximum um, you know uh, uh, growing space sort of um, occupied following the removal of those large trees and um, and you know, so a lot of these these harvests were done and then sort of walked away from without following up um, in terms of managing um, the stands after the harvest. So those two things go hand in hand in terms of creating some of the the, um, the forest change that, that we see. Here's a um, a picture, sort of uh, showing that um, in this case, you know, it uh, what you're looking at um, in the upper left is an area that um, for all we can tell, there doesn't appear to be any evidence of harvesting prior to this picture. Um, and even the, the large tree to the left of the the, um, the cabin doesn't appear to have been cut. Um, so this may um, largely be driven just by fire suppression alone. It doesn't look like there was a ton of harvesting right where this picture was, was taken. So just the removal of fire um, results in this type of um, this type of change where you see small trees coming in um, and, and filling all that what was sort of open growing space or at least in this case a lot of it was occupied by shrubs um, and and you have an overall um, change in density um, but then also um, and then almost more importantly from a fire standpoint is uh, the notion of, of continuity um, you have if you look in the upper left, yes, there are some continuity in that sort of shrub layer right around the surface, but if you look amongst the tree crowns, there's really zero continuity. You cannot imagine a fire moving from tree to tree in that in that sense. Whereas if you look in the in the right on the lower right, there is a ton of continuity. It's continuity horizontally um, where tree crowns are touching horizontally, but there's also um, another um, the continuity, the vertical continuity, where you can see how a fire could move from the surface to into the crowns of some of the small trees and then up again into some of the intermediate trees and then up again even into the tree crowns of, um, of, the, um, of the dominant trees. So much greater potential for fire, um, for basically crown fire, that, that is fire that gets into the, um, into the, the crowns of the dominant trees um, just, just by, in this case, by basically fire exclusion, fire suppression alone. Uh, we have a, there's been a number of studies that have sort of done these um, historical reconstructions. A lot of them are based on tree rings, where you uh, um, get information, whether they be from tree cores or you're cutting um, small sections of, of dead wood, and you try to date um, the you're using annual rings on the trees. You try to date backwards in time, and then reconstruct what trees were there. Um, or you know, at that site wherever you collected it, um, it, at some historical reference period, and a lot of times, like I said, that reference period was somewhere around the late 1800s or early 1900s. In this case, this is some data that we had from um, some forest inventories that were done in 1911, and this is prior to any harvesting. In fact, these surveys were done in, in advance of a harvest to um, anticipate the uh, you know just the the potential to harvest. Um, uh, you know, as sort of a first entry um, into these areas, and this is the area that these surveys were covered was um, was into the Stan in the Stanislaus National Forest, and then it went into Yosemite. Um, so, just to throw some numbers out at you, um, the the comparisons are pretty staggering when you when you think about it. So, in 1911. Um, one of the well, okay. First, I should back up and say one of the characteristics. There's a couple of characteristics we look at when we um, think about forest um, density. One of them is is called basal area. It's just the cross sectional area of um, of a tree, and then um, it's scaled up to the to the acre in this case. So what you know, when you see feet squared per acre, that's the cross sectional area of trees over a given acre, and these are these are averages. So that's one way. Basal area is one one metric of, of um, forest density. Another one is just, just simply a count of trees. Um, in, in this case, um, these are trees greater, what we're reporting is trees greater than six inches. And then to get at really the large tree component, we separate out trees larger than 36 inches just to see whether or not there, there's been a change um, in the number of large trees. So um, 
both metrics, either basal area or density, show a major increase um, from 1911 to 2013. And by the way, in 2013, that's when we went back and remeasured these um, these same exact areas where the where the surveys were done in 1911. So basically, a doubling um, in the basal area, um, and then you know almost a five-fold increase in just the number of trees. Um, so we we had about 20 or 22 trees. Um, per acre um, historically in 1911 now we have over a hundred and that's that would be a heck of a lot um, that difference would be even even greater um, if we were to include trees all the way down to let's say one inch um, in diameter uh, for this case in this historical survey they stopped they didn't record trees smaller than six inches so we're going to keep that comparison at this level um, at the six inch um, density but in any event major changes in the, um, in both basal area and tree density um, and that change has has also been a, a proportional change in, in the species composition. We're seeing a lot more of um, uh, white fir, Douglas fir, and cedar, um, and a lot less pine. Um, and that's kind of consistent with as as the forests get denser, um, the those um, the, the pine species are not able to, to compete well in low light environments. So th that fits sort of the ecology that um, our understanding of these. Um, the uh, you know what we call shade tolerant species, which can do all right, um, you know, can grow all right in the shade of other other trees. So major changes in forests. This, if you look at the pictures on um, on the bottom, those aren't repeat photos by any means of the same spot, but they tend they tell the, the story sort of the, the data tell. Twenty trees an acre, um, you know, give or take, you know, five or ten trees or whatever, depending on on whatever spot you're in versus over 100 trees an acre, yeah, you know, and again, think about that continuity thing that I was talking about before, both horizontally, um, you know, just tree to tree to tree, and vertically, how you can see fire climbing from the surface all the way up to the dominant tree crowns, and then what you probably can't see as well here is looking at some of the surface fuels. There's almost no surface fuel on the left um, that we can tell, and there's tons of surface fuel on the right that, that is litter um, and, and small branches. Um, that accumulate on the ground in the absence of fire. Uh, just to show you what this, you know, this forest change, what it um, results in, if you think about it from a sort of greater forest health standpoint, um, it's, it's, you know, it leaves you very vulnerable. Um, um, in this case, uh, we had some field plots um, from within the REM fire. We happened to be sampling for a different project. Um, and our, in fact, our field crews were chased out um, by the REM fire itself, but we got some really interesting data um, because we have data right from the time, you know, right before the time the, the fire was burning, and we went back and sampled those same areas. But this is what this is what it sort of turns out to be. You have a very vulnerable condition in the, in the left with the densities like we talked about, huge change in densities from historical levels, major um, increases in the amount of surface fuels, um, and this is what, you know, if you see on the right, that's the type of effects that you're prone to when you have those kind of conditions where forests as dense as they are, fuels as high as they are. Um, here's another example. This really illustrates how how bad the surface fuel condition was um, prior to the rim fire. And this is, you might say, okay, this is one example again, a, an extreme fire event. This is, but no, my, my argument would be no, this is characteristic of much of the, of the forest in the Sierra Nevada. They have a a similar history, um, you know, just just related to the, um, some of the early timber harvesting and then um, fire suppression and exclusion. And so the story, you know, could could very well be applied across um, across the, the mixed conifer range of, of, the, of, Sierra, of the Sierra Nevada. Um, again, so here's this, you know, just a major major change, um, you know, pre to post fire. You, every tree that you see there is dead. There's nothing on the surface of the soil. Um, problem, you know, potential problem for erosion and things like that. So, very vulnerable condition that our, our forests are in um, from a fire standpoint. Now, the other piece that we wouldn't have probably paid a lot of attention to um, a couple years ago, but obviously is catching people's eyes now, is this mortality piece. Independent of of, um, of fire, we're seeing major, major um, large tree mortality um, in the central and even more so in the in the southern Sierra. And the reason for that is, is very much the same as, as the change, the, the, the um, forest change, um, you know, that, that's causing the exacerbated fire effects. The same thing is going on, um, you know, with this mortality. 
basically, you know, large, or, you know, densification of the forest uh, means there's greater competition um, for uh, for resources, particularly water. Um, and then when we have these large drought events, um, like what we've been in um, over the last, you know, four to five years, major stress on the trees, and then you know the trees can't defend themselves um, from uh, from bark beetles. And so this. You know, you might say, "Oh, this is a bark beetle epidemic." Um, you know, it's it's a terrible thing. Well, no, I mean, it, yes, it's bark beetles that are doing the actual killing in a lot of these cases, but it's really more the forest sort of being out of whack. It's really the forest being too dense um, because of the lack of fire, um, and you know, in drought. So you know, drought has has always happened. Um, you know, this this one that we were just in was particularly severe. But we saw, I mean, if you look at the tree ring record, um, which, in, you know, goes back several hundred years, there have been severe drought events, maybe not as bad as the one we just saw, but we never saw any mortality like, um, like what we're seeing now. So it points to, you know, to the forest, you know, problem. Basically, the forests are out of whack and they just cannot, um, they cannot sustain the, the densities that they're at um, and it becomes very apparent under under drought, and the problem with with the mortality, I mean, you could say, one argument could be that that forests are, um, you know, they're overly dense. So what's the problem? The mortality is dealing, you know, maybe actually um, doing a good thing for you. It's reducing density. Well, the problem is that mortality is is it, it tends to be in some of the larger trees, and those are the ones that we want to hold on to, um, you know, both for both for aesthetics um, and for um, for wildlife, but also those trees, the larger trees are the ones that are more resistant to fire. They have thicker bark. They have higher, their limbs are higher off the ground. So it is very problematic that this mortality is hitting the large trees because, um, you know, so many different ripple um, effects um, after that. And then if you think about it too, you know, there's this potential interaction um, with mortality like this and then subsequent wildfire. Um, it, you can Im imagine what's going on here is that you have a lot of fuel, it's basically dead fuel now in the forest that is very receptive um, to uh, to fire spread. Basically, you know, in a green forest, if we were looking at this picture and it was all green, uh, you could, you know, the, the green um, is indicative of, of much higher moisture content in the needles. Um, and, and it takes a lot more heat uh, to ignite under those conditions when you have really high moisture content. When you have a lot of brown like this, you have very low moisture content. So this area, um, and, and this is true of so many areas that are, um, have been um, hit by these large mortality episodes, are very receptive um, to fire um, and, you know, from a spread and from a, an intensity um, component. So it, it's, it's concerning, this potential double interaction now of mortality than, than fire. Now, the other piece that you probably might have been wondering about, why I not you talked about climate at all? Well, I just I wanted to hammer this forest change piece, but but climate is certainly a part of it. it um, climate climate from um, the the what I'm showing here um, is the the you can report this in a number of different ways. I happen to to do this um, with a fire focus on it, but you could imagine, you know, let's you know, you could put temperature on this graph and it probably would look the same way. In this case, what we're looking at is the per the percentage of high fire weather days. Um, and these are five different stations that happen to be in the Northern Sierra, which is where we did the study. Um, but the percentage of high fire weather days has, has increased um, significantly over the last 30 um, or so, 30 or 40 years. So what that means is that there are just that many more days every given year where fire can grow large um, um, and, and sort of escape control. Um, you know, we, we have fantastic um, fire suppression resources where response times are really good. Um, so we are able to actually catch most fires at, um, at a pretty small size. It's those very few that get away that cause so much of the damage. When you see trends like this, where these increases um, in these these number of, of or percentage of high fire weather days in a given fire season, that just means there's much 
greater potential for these fires to grow very rapidly. Um, and in that case, you know, they can exceed our capacity to sort of catch them, if you will, at a, at a small size. So this doesn't inherently mean there's going to be more fire, but it means there's more potential um, for fire. But again, that's this is with a fire focus on it, but you could imagine, you know, if you graph temperature on there, or let's say even drought frequency or, or, or duration of the, um, you know, uh, dry dry soil or something like that. All it's all working together, um, and it's either causing you know stress on on some of these trees, you know, with increased temperatures or even longer durations of increased temperatures, um, or you know the magnitude of some of the droughts are getting maybe um, getting stronger. The point is, is that the two things are playing together in a very bad way. That that is forest change um, and climate. So. You know, it's you can't just point your finger at one of them, but there's one thing that we can do something about it, and that is, you know, we can we can at least directly do something about it, is this forest change. We can, you know, alter um, you know the the condition of, of current forests. So how you do that? Uh, there are a number of different ways. Um, you can we can do thinning, and in fact, there are a number of areas that are doing a great job, a fantastic job at, um, at thinning. Um, where they're, you know, in a way, leaving a lot of the larger trees um, for various reasons. Um, wildlife tends to be one of one of them, but there's a number of reasons why you might want to leave um, some of the larger trees on site. Um, and then, you know, you, um, there's other ways you can couple thinning. Um, where, you know, you can have it sort of be commercial, where you can actually pull off, um, you know, trees large enough to send off to the mill and make some money on it. Um, but, but from a a vulnerability standpoint, it's really some of the small trees um, that really cause um, the, these forests to be vulnerable, particularly to fire, um, because they act as that what we call a ladder, where they um, or allow fire to move sort of vertically um, through some of the stands. And those trees, the problem with them is you pull them out and they do nothing but cost you money. They, um, you know, there's nothing commercial about it, so you're basically just paying the, you know, to you know, paying the equipment time the, and all the, the disposal stuff, um, you know, related to those small trees. But a lot, but some of the best scenarios from a thinning standpoint are when you can couple the removal of those submergible trees with removal of commercial trees to make some money and essentially have the treatment sort of pay for itself. And one of one of the best tools we had, which um, you know, is is going away, but hopefully there's some way to bring it back, um, is is the um, use of biomass um, to send it to. Um, to um, plants to make um, make electricity, that was a great tool, um, and it was at its high point, at least when it was being used heavily um, in the Sierras. It was you know in the mid 2000s, um, but it again the capacity for that is going down, and, it, and it's too bad because now um, there's really nothing to do with the small trees except put them in giant piles and burn them, um, which has its own issues. But anyway, just from a restoration standpoint, that we certainly that component of thinning is huge um, and is going to have to, you know, is going to have to increase in, in capacity. And we're going to have to, you know, basically find ways to deal with some of those um, submergible trees. Another restoration treatment um, is prescribed fire. Um, a lot of people, uh, like I started out of the talk, don't are comfortable with fire. It, it uh, you know, it, it sort of they think about fire in that binary sense, um, and, it, and it is, you know, they don't trust that you can actually do some work with fire, but there are some very good um, examples of, of what you can do with prescribed fire alone. Um, I think I'm, I'm going to skip these, sorry, but I want to go um, to this. This is a great example of, of an area that has burned, I think it's been burned at least three times in the last maybe 30 or 40 years um, in Yosemite, um, and uh, it, one of the things that we're recognizing about about some of these these areas, particularly where the large tree component is still there, um, is that there's just a, a very unique pattern of the forest um, where you can see off to the right in this picture. There's these denser clumps of trees. We can see right in our foreground. It's pretty darn open. Um, it just there's a really um, what we call heterogeneous pattern of uh, forest that. Um, that we're starting to realize is probably an important piece that balanced some of the forest health concerns related to fire and mortality with some of the wildlife. Um, there's a, there tend to be um, several wildlife species that focus that 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 prefer these these dense clumps of trees. And so anyway, um, we're uh, we like 
the idea of using prescribed fire because it can sort of get at some of that really um, that really fine scale patterning of forests. And in some in some cases, some of the best combinations of treatments from a forest health and a fire you know from a forest health standpoint and um, even um, you know, well, I guess forest just in general forest health. Thinking about fire and um, tr uh, tree vigor are those that that combine um, you know thinning with some type of burning um, to deal with surface fuels. So um, in summary, just what you know the the point I think that that is difficult to to imagine, especially when you're used to um, the forests around you, let's say around your home or your vacation home, being a certain way. It's so hard to imagine that that, that what you're looking at really isn't quote unquote the natural condition of those forests. Um, it's, we have such greater density um, of trees, but then also um, also fuels. And then also we, ha we ha have much less variability now. Everything is just dense. Um, I mean, granted, that's a, that's a great overstatement, but in general, if you sort of zoom out a little bit, we have a much, much more homogenous forest condition than we did um, historically. And what that equals out to from a fire standpoint is we have these, you know, these proportions and extents of high severity that are that are that exceed historical levels, um, and that has all kinds of implications as to the regenerating condition of the forest. And uh, again, just to hit on this restoration thing, it's something that needs to happen at large scales. I think we've demonstrated it in a number of areas that we can do it well. Um, but it just, it's never really, at least on, when I'm talking about we, I'm talking about, I guess, on federal land, we just haven't been able to take it to a really meaningful scale. Um, we're treating, you know, let's say, in the order of, you know, for a given forest, a few thousand acres a year, but that needs to be a few tens of thousands of acres a year if we're going to try to make a difference, um, both from a fire standpoint and from a forest health standpoint. I mean, think about the tree mortality thing. Um, and then, I, you know, the notion of fire, all fire being bad, well, there's plenty of room for fire to do good work for us, um, both from a fuel reduction standpoint um, and um, from, you know, uh, uh, this tree patterning thing. That's it's something that we're starting to learn a little bit more about. So, um, you know, to the extent possible, you know, we need to try to increase our, our use of fire um, and, and people's, frankly, people's comfort um, with fire and the smoke <laughs> um, because, it, it, you know, we're going to have fire one way or the other. It's just you know, how long can you wait? And then, you know, what type of fire do you want? So I'll leave that at that. Okay, um, I think I probably ran out of time um, wrapping up. So a few acknowledgements here, and then I'm not sure how we're gonna handle questions. It might be at the very end. Um, I'll hand it right back over to Diana. Great, yeah, if we can um, hold questions to the end, that would be great. Oops, excuse me, hold on. All right, thanks so much, Brando. Um, now we'll move on to George Gentry, the Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at the California Forestry Association. George also goes by YG, that's uh, short for Young Growth. He began working part-time with his father, OG, that's Old Growth, at consultants in junior high. He became a full-time tech in 1977, graduated from HSU in 1983 with a degree in forest product management, and in the same year, he became a member of COFA. He earned his um, RPF license in 1985, became a business partner with his father. He was a consultant until 2002 when he became executive officer of Forest Reserve Licensing. And then he moved on to become the executive officer of the Board of Forestry and Fire Protection. In 2015, he left state service to become the vice president for regulatory affairs for the California Forestry Association. And Cal Forest is a member and sits on the Sierra Camp Steering Committee. So George, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Diana. Um, uh, one thing I'd like to say is that uh, if you ever doubt that uh, young growth can become late seral or old growth forest, that picture is all the proof you need. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about uh, policies related to this. I, I think Brandon gave you a really good overview of, of various things, including the fact of what makes the Sierra different from the rest of the state. It's not that the rest of the state doesn't suffer from some of the same issues. It's just that Sierra's uh, issues are much more magnified in terms of the climate arena, in terms of its impact on the forest. Uh, on the north coast, which is where I'm from, uh, it's still somewhat mitigated by the rainfall. But here with the lo low snowpack and the drought conditions, 
the conditions here are much more severe. The densities are, are much more impactive uh, when it comes to trees. So you're, he set it up very well for what uh, I'm about to talk about, which is the overall policy. Uh, next slide, please. So what Diana asked me to talk about was these points. There's an overview of the key forestry policies uh, in relation to mitigation, the key forestry policies for adaptation, policy gaps and opportunities, and in particular I wanted to talk about inventory methods, and then uh, GGRF, greenhouse gas uh, funding uh, for uh, forests. Next slide, please. Now, this is an important point, and Brandon kind of touched on it, but I want to make sure you understand what we're talking about here. Now, this particular slide talks about the total amount of forest land in the state. So if you look at this chart, you see the private forest amounts to about 13 million acres, and, and federal government has about uh, 19. Government total is probably a little over 20 uh, million board, uh, 20 million feet. Now that's forest land. That's all forest land. It includes hardwood and conifer. If you just look at conifer lands, the things that we may, mainly are going to be focused on today, the ratio tilts even more in, uh, in the ratio for the federal government. They essentially own two to one in terms of acreage. So somewhere around, oh, say 17 million acres of timberland to eight to nine million acres of timberland in private. So it's, there's a two to one ratio. And this ratio is even greater for the Sierra. So in other words, there's a higher proportion of federal land in the Sierra than there is, say, on the North Coast relative to the private land. And so when you talk about all the issues related to timberland or forests in the Sierra, you're essentially going to have to talk about how the federal government deals with those particular issues since they're the biggest player here. Okay, next slide, please. So I want to kind of use this slide here as my jumping off point, and so we're going to stay on this one for a little bit because I want to talk about how the policies all overlap. We start with the Air Resources Board, and why? Well, I'm sure you're all familiar with Assembly Bill 32, the California Global Warming Solutions Act. That was signed into law in 2006 by Governor Schwarzenegger, and essentially it says, reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by 2020. So in order to do that, there's only, a, there's only two things you really need to look at. One is what are you emitting into the atmosphere and what are you sequestering or holding, sinking into uh, the terrestrial or ocean uh, sink. So it becomes very important to talk about how you're going to account for those things. So the first thing on my list there is inventory. So the Air Resources Board talks about inventory, and they're essentially looking at, for forests, uh, tracking the removal of the carbon dioxide. Uh, the inventory will include uptake by the vegetation, emissions from wild and prescribed fires, decomposition and combustion of residues from harvest, conversion, so in other words, if the forest land is no longer economically viable, if it gets converted to, say, a subdivision and it's no longer sequestering carbon uh, and uh, wasted wood products. Uh, the main gases we're talking about here, obviously, are carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. All of these things can be a product of uh, combustion. Um, and so how you count for this is very important. So are you counting for it just on the timberland? Are you counting for it on all forest land? Are you counting for it on the shrubland? Are you counting for it on the private? Are you counting for it on the public lands? How do you bring those things all together? Now the offset protocols are a series of protocols that was developed by the Air Resources Board. They've gone through a couple of different iterations, but essentially the purpose of the uh, protocol is to quantify the reductions 
and the removal enhancements associated with the sequestration of carbon by increasing or conserving forest carbon stocks. So if I own land, there's a certain way that if I manage my land, I can account for how much carbon I've actually sequestered. And that's important to know. That's just as important as knowing what the basic inventory is. Your basic inventory is going to tell you what you have in the bank, so to speak, and the protocols will tell you what you can add to that bank. And that's important for item three, which is cap and trade. And that's what AB 32 really is shooting for. And that is where you have a cap on the emissions, total emissions in the state. And so polluters that are uh, releasing or emitting carbon into the atmosphere can make a trade or purchase credits from people who are capturing carbon. And that bodes well for the forest products industry because that's what we do. We essentially grow trees and we sequester carbon so we could trade that and use that as an offset for other polluters. That's a very important and technical thing, but you have to understand how important they are in order to set up the entire equation. The scoping plan is an offshoot of the AB32. So scoping plan is how the Air Resources Board sets up each of the sectors that they are considering and gives them a certain uh, theme or actions to pursue. So they just updated the scoping plan for the forest sector. I think they actually call it uh, private and working lands. Uh, but in any case, as it applies to forestry, they basically talk about um, mitigations. That scoping plan is, uh, is in turn direct, uh, directed to the forest climate action team. Now that forest climate action team is a combination of EPA, uh, Environmental Protection Agency, a ARB, uh, CAL FIRE, and the Resources Agency. And I'll get more into the carbon plan and, it, and what it says in adaptation in just a bit. But first, let's talk a little bit about the scoping plan itself. It basically has several arenas. It talks about afforestation and reforestation. So afforestation is areas that previously had trees, no longer have trees, or uh, an area that um, uh, doesn't have any trees and so you convert it to forest. Uh, reforestation is, is uh, more of along the lines of areas that were catastrophically uh, devoured by fire or what have you, some sort of natural cause and then were reforested. Forest management is another strategy, so how you manage it can increase the amount of carbon sequestered. There's urban forestry, planting trees within um, urban sectors in order to reduce uh, consumption of fuels, uh, uh, shading effects. Um, forest conservation, that's where you set aside certain areas. Fuels management, which you heard uh, Brandon talk about quite extensively here just a second ago and forest materials and bioenergy, which Brandon also touched upon. So an initial analysis by CAL FIRE years ago said that status quo management would sequester uh, 30 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent over a 10-year period. So that was the initial thought going in, was that business as usual would give you 30 million metric tons over a 10-year over a period. And that's the basis we started from. AB 32 said uh, we want to maintain uh, 5 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent sequestration in the forestry sector. So now we come to the Forest Climate Action Team. I think some of you may be familiar with it. They have a website. And this is, as I mentioned, this is a group that's got CAL FIRE, CAL EPA, Natural Resources. And their job is to develop a forest carbon plan uh, based upon uh, the scoping plan and they're supposed to do it by the end of the year and they're supposed to come up with all the solutions how we're going to move forward on these 33 million acres of forest land that we just uh, illustrated here a couple slides ago. So uh, 
in talking about that, their basic strategy there is that they have come up with in their draft plan, uh, summarizing the best available science, uh, establishing forth and forest health and resiliency conditions, again, Brandon kind of touched on that, developing targets, uh, provide a framework for managing forested landscapes to increase carbon sequestration, addressing wildland forests and urban forests, and be consistent with fire management goals and strategies. Adaptation and mitigation sometimes cross over on each other. A lot of what Brandon was talking about there falls in the range of adaptation. So we're talking about the changing climatic conditions in the Sierras and how we are going to adapt to them. He showed you a slide that showed uh, optimal tree density in 1911 and, and what the tree density is currently. Uh, the truth is that we may not even have uh, the right conditions now to, uh, even if we took it back to 1911 stocking densities, it still might not uh, be uh, adequate given our current climatic conditions. Uh, there is uh, a need to reduce these fuels and these stand densities. As uh, Brandon was pointing out, uh, we're way overstocked and that's causing and exacerbating a lot of the problem. Okay, I'd like to go to the next page, please, next slide. So here we see, I stole this from uh, Dr. Kurz, who did a presentation uh, a couple of months ago, and I think it illustrates very well what mitigation strategies we're talking about. Dr. Kurz is from Canada, so no, I did not misspell minimize and maximize, that's how they spell it in Canada. Uh, but here you see that you're looking to minimize net emissions into the atmosphere or maximize the carbon stocks. So you're trying to get more carbon into the forest ecosystems and then when you utilize it, you utilize it either as biofuel or wood products and then uh, the, the um, uh, avoid over on the left conversion to non-forest land use which I brought up earlier. Now an important point to remember when you're accounting for all this is that circled area right there. A lot of people look at uh, the issue of utilizing wood products and fail to account for substituting for other products. So if I use a 2 by 4 as opposed to using concrete to build something, I have a much smaller carbon footprint because concrete is one of the most carbon intensive uh, products you can use, whereas the wood that's utilized in building stays sequestered for a, a long period of time. So durable wood products, even though we cut them and remove them from the, from the woods, still are sequestering carbon in their form as a building product. Uh, same way with biofuel. Biofuel displaces uh, fossil fuel because we're not using fossil fuels Instead, we're using something that comes out of our normal course of business by bringing in these things, these products from uh, out in the woods. So accounting for those uh, substitution benefits is a key component in accounting for all of this. Uh, next slide, please. Now, how does this impact uh, the Sierras? Well, this particular chart shows the uh, composite forest carbon assets in a particular scenario. This was run by FRAP and if you look at 2010 the dark green means more carbon and the lighter uh, tan means medium carbon and then the, uh, the darker color means low terrestrial carbon. So not surprisingly the Mojave uh, has uh, low uh, terrestrial carbon. Sierra looks pretty good but as you follow it through time and you get to 2100 uh, or 2100, <clears throat> you can see that the carbon uh, value has started to thin out. Now this is part of the adaptation piece. As the climate changes, the uh, composition of species changes. And so the conifers start retreating further and higher up in elevation. So instead of growing at, say, 3,000 feet, maybe they, the particular species will retreat to 4,000 feet, thereby shrinking its footprint. And therefore, we won't have as many of the large woody uh, plants 
at lower elevations that allow us to sequester carbon. It's less severe, as you can see, over on the uh, coast where the uh, effects are more mitigated, but it's much more apparent in the Sierra. And that's an important point to remember. And remember what I said as well. Uh, this is uh, this air particular area is two to one or better uh, in terms of uh, federal ownership. And most of that high altitude ownership is federally owned. So we're going to see uh, along the way here this, this shrinking and contracting of the resource to higher elevations. Next slide, please. So now we see the threat. This particular picture isn't the best. This is another uh, FRAP, and by FRAP I mean Forest uh, Resource and Assessment Program. That's an arm of uh, CAL FIRE. But essentially what it shows is where the threat to the carbon resource is. Um, and what you see is, is over time there's less of a threat in the Sierra. That's because the carbon's going away. The underlying carbon is, is being removed, and so it's no longer much of a threat because the carbon's going away. So in 2010, there's a significant threat in the Sierra, and by 2100, there's less of a threat because the underlying carbon has already retreated further up the hill, and there's, so the underlying resource is gone. Next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit here about how you account for these things. So there's inventories that account for various ways in carbon and uh, some only account for live carbon some account for other kinds of carbon the Board of Forestry and Fire Protection under Assembly Bill 1504 has to ensure that its rules and regulations that govern the harvesting of commercial tree species where applicable consider the capacity of forest resources including above ground and below ground biomass and soil to sequester carbon dioxide emissions sufficient to meet or exceed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide, please. So how do you account for carbon? And here on one side, you see uh, various timber types. So you see corporate timber, family timber, private for other private forests, national forest service timber. And then across the top, you see soil carbon, uh, down and dead carbon, above ground dead carbon, above, above ground live carbon, uh, energy, end product, landfill, substitution, and out of stage. Every one of these is a place where the carbon can reside. So what you count is very important. Now there have been some inventories that only account above ground live carbon. And that doesn't look at the whole picture. And it doesn't, under, it doesn't begin to contemplate the co-benefits or the substituted benefits. And that's an important point because the carbon molecule doesn't care. It's going to be somewhere, and we need to know where they are. Next slide, please. So that brings me to the Forest Inventory and Analysis Program of the Pacific Northwest uh, Research Station. So they talked about, they, they have been working with the Board of Forestry and they've been working on their inventory method. Now, a lot of the things we're talking about right now are models. Now, what uh, FIA, as we call it, does is they have on the ground plots, permanent plots that they look at to determine what's going on in the nature of things for California. So based on an estimate of change over two time intervals and groups of plots, so they had these intervals for national forests and federal ownerships, and then the others for all other ownerships. Their current estimate of the rate of net annual carbon sequestration is 9.6 million metric tons CO2 equivalent per year. Now remember that our target originally under AB 32 is 5 million metric tons. But this accounts for annual rate of growth, mortality, and harvest. It does not include at this time a change in downwood soil carbon or harvested wood products. So this is just a very uh, large scale, uh, 20,000 foot level view and it says 9.6 million metric tons are being sequestered. It does not take into account these other aspects yet, but they intend to over time because that's an important part of the component so let's talk a little bit about the impacts 
that we are currently seeing. Next slide, please. As uh, Brandon talked about, we have a very serious situation. This presentation was just done by Chris Fettig from Pacific Southwest Research Station for the Board of Forestry and Fire Protection. And his original talk was called 63 Million Trees and Counting. And then it was his, his talk changed to 66, and then it changed to 67 million trees and counting, all within the space of like a couple of weeks. Next, next slide. Essentially what we're talking about, of course, is the 67 million trees that are dying. So Brandon talked about managing, and he showed you some things, prescribed fire, thinning, etc. The uh, IPCC in 2007 said, in the long term, a sustainable forest management strategy aimed at maintaining or increasing forest carbon stocks while producing an annual sustained yield of timber, fiber, or energy from the forest would generate the largest sustained mitigation benefit. So in other words, if you want to have the most carbon sequestered, this is the strategy. Next slide, please. The greatest gains in both CO2 equivalent and uh, savings is through avoiding needing, needing to manufacture, transport, and construct concrete and steel. That's what I was talking about earlier, the avoidance pathway, the offset, the substitution benefit by substitution of wood products. Now, above there you see a couple of examples, and I'm sure many of you have heard about the um, uh, tall buildings program where they're building now skyscrapers in the Pacific Northwest out of wood because the, they're making cross laminated timbers. And some of these buildings are sequestering huge amounts of carbon. Next slide please. There's a lot of words here and I understand from uh, PowerPoint experts that this is not what you're supposed to do, but I wanted to put this here anyway. Uh, because I wanted to make the point that um, your next thing that you were curious about or that Diana asked me to talk about was funding. So the cap and trade program, a key element of the scoping plan, began in 2012. A portion of the permits established by the cap and trade program are sold at quarterly auctions and reserve sales. The legislature and the government appropriate proceeds from the sale of state-owned allowances for projects that support the goals of AB 32. Strategic investment of these proceeds furthers the goal of AB 32 by reducing emissions, providing net sequestration, and supporting long-term transformative efforts needed to improve the public and environmental health and develop a clean energy economy. So bottom line, what does that mean? Next slide. Here's their annual report. The California High Speed Rail Authority gets $850 million of the proceeds. If you look down towards the bottom, you'll see Sustainable Forests, it's the second one from the bottom, $42 million. So right there you see that um, even though there's a couple of billion dollars available, uh, the priority as determined at this point for forestry is very low. Next slide please. And that is because when they do their accounting, when they uh, look at the carbon, they say 44 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent is saved by the high-speed rail system. And when you look over at the uh, Natural Resources and Waste Division, uh, you know, it's less than 5 million metric tons is what they, they uh, attribute to it. So based on the projects that are funded. So they're looking at, when you have a high speed rail system with 44 million metric tons in the accounting system, it's pretty hard to overcome that uh, unless you can show uh, accounting wise how that all fits in. But there's one other problem, next slide. Here's the proceeds to date. It does not include the last auction that occurred about a week or so ago. And you can see they started out pretty well. They had a 250 million and they went up to 1.5 million in 1415. Uh, 
and then look at the quarterly auctions uh, from 15 on and you see it's moving along at about uh, 500, 600 million dollars and then all of a sudden 10 million dollars and I believe the last one was right around 8.4 million dollars so at that rate they're not going to have a lot of funds in the GHG uh, reduction fund and so there's going to be precious little money available for any of these projects at this point. Now there's any number of factors that can contribute to why these auctions have not succeeded over the course of the last uh, few uh, auctions and that could be because of the threat of litigation which has been uh, pretty uh, steep and uh, it's uncertain as to whether or not this program uh, will be able to survive litigation. Um, and it could also just be that there's too many of these things available, supply and demand. So like uh, the, nobody's interested in having them uh, at this particular price or they're coming up with other solutions to deal with their emissions. So that's a quick and dirty uh, review uh, of what I was talking about for policy. Um, next slide. And that's my conclusion. Great. Thank you so much, George. Um, really appreciate it. And now we'll moving, be moving on to a quick recap of, or not recap, but rather um, outlook on Sierra Camp's forest and climate policy priorities going forward. Um, we are, we'll probably be running over five or ten minutes, depending on the number of questions, but we will still have time for Q&A at the end, so please hold on to those, and you're welcome to begin answering them, or um, rather plugging them into the question box of the GoToWebinar window. So now I'll be introducing Carrie Timmer. She's the Government Affairs Director for Sierra Business Council. She is a Communications and Management Specialist with more than 25 years of public and private sector experience in community and government relations, business communications, land and water conservation, and nonprofit management and capacity building. Before joining SBC um, about three years ago, she spent six years with the Sierra Nevada Conservancy, um, where she served as the agency's regional policy and program manager. She holds a BA in English Literature from San Francisco State University and a Certificate in Land Use and Natural Resource Planning from UC Davis Extension. Um, she now, uh, as Government Affairs Director for Sierra Business Council, she also sits on the Sierra Camp Steering Committee. Okay, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Diana. Um, and also, thank you so much to Brandon and YG for the, the primer on forest health and the effects of climate change on our forests. I have to say it's a little bit depressing, the pictures, and um, seeing that, that chart that compares forestry metrics with high-speed rail metrics. I see your point, YG, about uh, it, it does sort of make it a little bit clearer why the forestry and natural resource issues have been getting what feels to be somewhat short shrift in, in these carbon discussions. Um, so what I'd like to do for a few minutes here is share with you where CAMP has been activating um, and trying to intervene where possible in a variety of state policy aspects and give you a sense of where we think we're headed uh, in the coming year. So um, yes, if you could advance to the next slide, please. Great. Um, I think certainly uh, Brandon has made this case for us that, that the system is fragile. It's very vulnerable as a result of prior management and other activities. And so to cut to the chase, really what, uh, what Sierra Camp has been doing is to try to elevate the importance of these resource issues to the decision makers in Sacramento. Um, next slide, please. So what we've really been working on are four key areas. The first is, and this is what gets a little depressing with, with YG's comparison charts, but the first is trying to get more equitable funding for rural areas. And so what that really means is both increasing the amount of state funding that comes into resource areas like the Sierra from sources like GGRF, the, the cap and trade auction funding that, he, that George the YG was talking about, also things like the water bond um, and just general agency uh, funding for conservation and restoration activities 
and you know the point here is that these these resource rich areas have a lot to offer in terms of uh, helping the state meet its goals regarding forest and watershed health and also climate. Um, and we, we need the funding to do the kind of projects that Brandon was, was talking about specifically to reduce the vulnerability uh, as both an adaptation and mitigation strategy for climate change. And then also, uh, in, addition, in addition to increasing the actual amount of dollars that come to the region, also removing obstacles to rural investment. So out of other pots of money that might be not necessarily specifically directed at the Sierra, but that uh, you know have competitive processes for choosing projects from around the state, we want to be sure that there are no either intentional, unfortunately, or unintentional obstacles that would keep projects from rural areas like the Sierra from being eligible or successful and competitive in those larger pots. So that's the first thing, more equitable funding. The second, um, YG touched on this certainly in his metrics and methodologies part of his discussion, and that is to, to make sure that the appropriate methodologies are being used to determine the inventory and to determine the benefit of different types of activities that, that could be funded. Um, uh, what is often missing, as he pointed out, is the you know, some of the transitional things or the co-benefits that you get from doing these projects, um, not only what you might be replacing in terms of a building material or uh, uh, a fuel source, but also benefits to, say, public health by reducing wildfire emissions in certain communities or uh, improvements to the local communities to be able to uh, sustain themselves better by having a forestry sector that is active and robust or recreation that is active and robust because of course nobody really wants to go recreate in a place that looks like some of the pictures that were uh, that were shown by Brandon earlier. Um, third is building support for biomass. I think uh, both of the previous speakers have made a clear case for the benefits of biomass uh, in terms of supporting the kind of forest activity that, that we think needs to be done. Um, California used to have 66 biomass energy facilities. Now we're down to like 20 or fewer and another one just closed last week. Um, so we really need to crack this policy nut that will allow for support of the biomass industry in the same way that we support um, the hydro industry or the solar industry so that biomass could be considered a viable alternative fuel source and then finally, um, in addition to just to bringing more of the existing dollars into the region, we're also trying to figure out and working with partners to, to determine what might be a reasonable approach to this, but to find a, a longer term, more permanent funding source for this kind of work so that um, we're not having to rely on the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, whose future is a little bit uncertain, as YG pointed out, or uh, you know, bond acts in the future where it's hard to know the decisions get made kind of behind closed doors at the last minute in terms of who gets how much money. So if we could find a more uh, specific, permanent, long-term funding source that would be dedicated to doing this kind of work, uh, we, we wouldn't have to fight fresh every single year. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is really just to make the case that uh, as Diana pointed out at the very beginning of this webinar, the basis of our overall strategy is promoting a better understanding, especially with decision makers in Sacramento, about how people throughout the entire state are connected to the many resources that the Sierra provides. So it's not just forests, but water and habitat for species and um, alternative energy opportunities and recreation and things like that. So there's, there's a, again, this speaks to the co-benefit opportunities of doing projects that also will either store more carbon or reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide, please. And so we really refer to this strategy as the rural-urban connection. Um, you know, why, why? Why does LA or San Francisco care? Or why does it, you know, why do they matter when we're talking about climate impacts that are occurring in the Sierra Nevada? Well, because we're all in this together. So the urban areas that lie downstream from the resource areas like the Sierra or the North Coast, um, you know, they rely on us for their much of their water and much of their power. So if something happens to those resources up here in the foothills or the mountains, 
uh, it's definitely going to affect lives down there. So, and that said, we rely on the urban areas too for goods and services that, that we can't produce here, and also, frankly, for the political power that they have that we don't. So to try to get the best mutual outcomes, we're, tr we're trying to focus on bringing the urban and the rural together so that we can figure out what each other's needs are and then try to resolve uh, in ways that will benefit both of us. Next slide, please. I'm going to skip the detail here for time, but what I'm, I just wanted to kind of illustrate this connection between urban and rural. Um, we have talked about the rim fire. So you see in the map on the, on the left that um, the area in purple there is the watershed area from which uh, San Francisco gets about 85% of its water through the Hetch Hetchy Tuolumne River system. And that was directly affected and threatened by the Rim Fire. Um, you'll see in the picture on the right is a fire scar. It's not quite as visible as I would like it to be, but it's a fire scar uh, right underneath the power line. So, you know, not only is there uh, potential impacts on water quality and supply and distribution, but also potential impacts on energy distribution in this case. And just as an example, the governor declared a state of emergency in the city of San Francisco related to this fire the day after he declared an emergency in Tuolumne County, and it was because of the potential impacts to water and power. So this is just a way to, to really make visible that, that urban-rural connection. Next slide, please. Actually, Diana, you can just skip that one as well. It's, it's a similar situation for Los Angeles, where a fire in the upper watershed there uh, affected the um, source water for Los Angeles that gets a big part of it, portion of its water from the state water system. So getting to, you know, really where it is that we feel we have opportunity for uh, intervention, it's largely at, at these state programs. Level. So the funding that comes either through the budget process or uh, from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund or from the water bond or a parks bond or, or something typically gets distributed out to state agencies who then have programs uh, where largely they have competitive grant programs where they will fund projects on the ground to achieve the goals established for these different programs. And so without diving into too much detail, unless people have questions later about that, um, you know, AB 32 that, that both of the previous speakers referenced have, AB 32 has quite a number of different um, guiding documents, the scoping plan and California bioenergy plan and safeguarding California plan and so on. So those are all places where Sierra Camp has been engaged and will continue to engage, again, to try to elevate this concept of the need for uh, a rural program and investment to help the state achieve its greenhouse gas reduction goals. And there's a lot of, a lot of different pieces to that. For example, there's a, uh, up to 25% of the greenhouse gas reduction funds are intended to be spent in disadvantaged communities, and there's a process for how those are identified. And unfortunately, the criteria that are used for identifying those communities completely um, screen out any communities in the entire Sierra Nevada or North Coast area. So, you know, that's just, it's not to say that we don't have disadvantaged communities here, because we certainly do, but the criteria that are used to determine them uh, are, are based on kind of urban issues, therefore we don't show up, and therefore we are ineligible to access, the, you know, that portion of the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. So, and then other things like what YG mentioned with the Forest Carbon Action Plan, and um, uh, what Brandon mentioned about the Tree Mortality Task Force, you know, there's just every one of these programs has one or more guiding documents or grant guideline documents that determine how the money gets distributed or who's eligible. And so those are all places where we try to intervene. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and then finally, uh, legislation. So <laughs> we could go on forever about this. We're in the last three days of the legislative session, um, but this is another place where Sierra Camp tracks individual bills. And I have to admit, this year we were fairly reactive because this was our first year really engaging in this, in this process at such a, a level. Next year we hope to be a bit more proactive in terms of working with uh, sympathetic legislators to, 
possibly even carry a bill on our behalf that can achieve a goal of ours. But you know, let's, there's been bills covering virtually all of the topics that we've discussed today. Um, you know, the definition of disadvantaged communities, uh, extending the cap and trade program, um, biomass bills related to trying to support the existing biomass facilities, uh, so they don't they don't have to go out of business, and we have them as a uh, mechanism to deal with the material that's being taken off the forest for fuel purposes and so on. So, um, you know, up to 5,000 bills can be introduced in any given legislative session. So it's a it's a, a feeding frenzy initially, but we you know we use various criteria to narrow it down, and then the ones that we're really going to take action on, we track the progress of the bill and we attend and testify at hearings and we put together sign-on letters for members of camp and other partners um, and meet with legislators and their staff. So it's, um, it's quite an active part of our program and um, we hope to have, we've had some successes this year uh, in terms of either changing bills that might have been you know that might have been in some way harmful to the to the Sierra, as well as you know more positive bills that we think are going to bring benefit. So this is um, uh, part of the program that that we put a fair amount of resources into, and uh, hope that you will join us. And with that, uh, Diana, I'll throw it back to you. Great, thanks so much, Carrie, um, and YG and Brandon. Um, now I'm going to go ahead and open it up for questions. Let's see, we're, we have a couple minutes before the hour, um, and then we'll probably, depending on the number of questions, go about five or ten minutes after if um, that were for our speakers. But let's jump in. We have a couple questions in the question box, so feel free to answer there. Otherwise, you can raise your hand clicking on the, the hand icon, and I can unmute you and you can ask there. Um, so our first question comes from Steve Frisch, president of Deer Business Council. He asks, the cap and trade program has undersold allowances in the last two offers. Are you confident that the program can get back on track? How did the new cap and trade program amendments released in July bring us closer to a stable market? And I'll open that up to, um, to any of the speakers who want to chime in. Well, this is YG. <clears throat> no. I don't know how else to answer the question, to be honest with you. Two straight auctions at that rate do not bode well. And uh, I'm very, I'm personally very skeptical at this point as to what's going to occur. Again, it's a supply and demand issue. If people want to buy these uh, credits, they will. But um, two straight auctions like this is not very comforting. Well, and this is Carrie. I would just add that you know, it's, it's maybe it, if we look at it in the bigger picture uh, and over a longer period of time, which of course may may be affected by the outcome of the lawsuit if we ever get to an outcome there. Um, but you know, in in terms of how the California's program fits into the Western States program, and even working with Canada and Quebec and so on, I mean, there might. As I'm, I've been led to understand that there might be some things that ARB could do in terms of kind of ratcheting down the availability of allowances for a period of time so that the demand would build back up a little bit. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know that that's the answer, but I just think there might, there might be some things that can be done, especially now that we have the uh, SB 32 on the governor's desk, which would extend and increase the reduction targets out to 2030. Uh, you know, that might give a bit more leeway and confidence to move the program forward. Thanks. Our next question um, comes from Gary Bowen. He asks, given both forests and soils importance at the UN Paris Climate Talks, can you elaborate a bit more on soil in terms of um, state policy? And Gary is with the Tahoe Future Forum. So the question is how soils will factor into this policy? Is that is that essentially it? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think if you can just share any, if you're aware of any major components of soil in terms of the, the policies identified and discussed today. Yeah, so AB 1504 is going to look, in terms of uh, forest soils, is going to look at that. Now, there isn't any real um, plot data. It's all modeling at this juncture. 
so I'm not sure how reliable it will be, but clearly uh, below ground um, uh, carbon and soil carbon are going to be factors in all of this. So yes, it, I know that at least AB1504 will be looking at it. Great. Um, another question um, coming from Will Coleman. Um, he asks, have you considered expanding market-based incentives designed to recruit private sector investment in forest management needs? Carbon sequestration is one such market mechanism that can be layered with an expanded program to reward investment with other mitigation credits related to water, habitat, and species needs. So the question is, have you considered expanding market-based incentives to recruit private sector investment? You know, that's always been a discussion that's been around the edges, and if I'm interpreting the question correctly, so how do you monetize other ecosystem benefits besides the straight up carbon? You know, there's been various attempts, uh, in particular as they relate to water, but uh, water is a very tricky issue, especially in the era of drought. I, I don't disagree that there ought to be some sort of way of, of addressing that because uh, when you have 70 percent plus of the water originating on the forested landscape and I think uh, Carrie's illustration of the uh, rim fire and Hetch Hetchy is, is, is the perfect example of that um, as well as uh, the areas around the King fire where there were impacts to the Placer County uh, water supply it only heightens the the need for um, uh, some sort of equity in terms of uh, providing ecosystem services for the public as a whole. Um, a lot of people, I guess, just don't make that direct connection that how important uh, those services that are being provided uh, are to the uh, the general population. But uh, I know that there's been discussions about it, but um, I don't know that they've really ever taken off that much. Yeah, and I, that would be a major part of the the more proactive nature of what Sierra Camp is hoping to do in this coming year legislative session, and that is, you know, bring people together and, and really map out what the right questions are and how do we answer them and how do we put together uh, some recommendations for valuing those kinds of uh, ecosystem services. So that will be a big part of what we're focusing on in the coming year. And there have been a few studies that are that are largely avoided cost type studies that I think is, is what YG is referring to as well of, you know, what can downstream water agencies avoid in terms of treatment costs or, uh, you know, equipment operations and maintenance if you can reduce the amount of sedimentation that might come from a high intensity fire like the King Fire or the Rim Fire. So there, there is some studies there are some studies out there that look at that that we can refer to. Oh, and I see and I also, a, a, sorry, a follow-on from Will about um, private public-private partnerships, uh, and certainly there are some companies that are doing that already. So Coca-Cola, I believe, has a, a water neutrality um, goal, and so it is investing in upper watershed areas upstream of where some of their bottling facilities or manufacturing facilities are in order to uh, offset the water that they use for their production purposes. And I think a couple of the breweries have gotten into that uh, frame of mind as well. So there, that's something that we will definitely be looking into. Where, have, where has there been success in doing that? And, you know, kind of what, what did they learn from their uh, initial foray into these kind of public-private partnerships? Thanks. And if you have any final questions for the uh, audience, please um, enter them in now. We're just going to take a few more. Um, next question is, does state government, this comes from Richard Anderson, supervisor of Nevada County. He asks, does state government have a role to play in building a market for cross-laminated timber? Well, in, in any uh, case, uh, for cross-laminated timbers, uh, of course, the role would be to make sure that the regulations allow for it. So like uh, you have to be able to uh, utilize these things in structures and, and so like they have to go through a certain amount of testing and, and proving in order to be utilized. So there's a regulatory component there. Uh, 
um, and at the end of the day, encouraging their use is important as well because uh, that will encourage the uh, local indus the industry to invest in the technology to make cross laminated timbers. They're already doing so in Washington and Oregon, and uh, in in order to uh, have that kind of a situation here in California, we need to say that we want this particular product, that we are going to encourage. Uh, building with that product and that the regula regulations here allow for it. And the nice thing about a product, oh, sorry, Dana. Oh, uh, go ahead, nice Carrie. We have a follow-up follow question to that as well. Okay. Um, a nice thing about uh, using biomass to create products like that versus, it's not an either-or, but in some cases versus using biomass to create energy is you know, you don't have that um, utility and whether the utility is going to purchase the energy that you create, you don't have that kind of problem if you are producing this product. So a, a mix of uh, using biomass for energy production, alternative energy, as well as uh, products is, I think, a good, a good thing to look at. Great. And a follow-up to that comes from Dave, David Wilkinson. Um, he asked, how do we work together to develop cross-laminated timber facilities, and will large timber companies capitalize this industry in the foreseeable future? I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat the first part of that? Yep. Um, he, said, he asked, how do we work together to develop cross-laminated timber facilities in California, and then will large timber companies capitalize on this industry in the foreseeable future? Uh, it's unknown if they if they will or not. If they see a, a market there, I'm certain that they will. Uh, but they're wait. They're, I think they're kind of waiting to see. It's a significant investment to get into a market like that. And if they see that the the market is developing and that people are willing to use the product, they'll definitely do, build the uh, facilities in order to take advantage of it. Um, uh, an important thing to remember here, though, and I can't emphasize this enough. Continuity of supply is the key. You can, you can talk about building the infrastructure, but you need to have a commitment that the supply will be there. We've lost, in the last 20 years, over 100 mills. And the reason we lose these mills is because the federal, uh, the Forest Service doesn't harvest timber in anything like the scale they used to, even though they have a crying need for it now. And if they would commit to a steady supply, then the infrastructure will follow. And in, in terms of building the, the uh, product, that's not really the issue. It's the issue of whether or not the supply will be stable enough for them to invest. Great, thank you. Um, so we have one last question, and that comes again from Jerry Bowen with the Tahoe Future Forum. He asked, given the ratio of the priorities identified in one of the earlier charts, um, how do we embrace the importance of being an upstream as a source to more benefit downstream human activities? So how do we um, leverage and, and support the upstream nature of Sierra Nevada resources? Well, I'll take a crack at this one first. I think this is really the basis for uh, Sierra Camp's urban rural strategy. So. Uh, we didn't really get to talk about it in too much detail, but the political power uh, in terms of voters and uh, financial support and so on is really ho housed in the urban downstream areas. Uh, you know, we have such, uh, we have far fewer people who, and voters who live in these upstream areas, so we just, we, we don't bring as much to the table in that regard when it comes to the exercise of political will and decision making. So uh, while on the one hand, the focus of camp, Sierra Camp, is to bring together Sierra voices on the things that we can agree upon so that we have a stronger, more unified voice, but on the other hand, that has not proven to be enough in the past. And so we are really gearing toward uh, taking that unified voice from the resource areas like the Sierra and partnering with our downstream neighbors, uh, you know, other organizations, uh, other political leaders, and in the hopes that, you know, if they understand, better understand the, the very strong connection and the very strong link they have, that their well-being depends on uh, the condition of the resources up the hill, that, that they will ask 
their legislators and their decision makers who have the power and who lead all the committees in the legislature and who are uh, who lead the assembly and lead the Senate and have have the governor's ear uh, that they will ask for the same things because it's in their best interest to make sure that the conditions up the hill are improving. So that's we're going to give that a shot. I can't improve upon that answer. <laughs> Well, um, a big thank you to our presenters, Carrie Timmer, uh, George Gentry, YG, and um, Brandon Collins. Thank you for sharing this information, and thank you to the audience for participating and your interest in this issue. If you'd like to learn more about Sierra Camp, please um, feel free to contact me. My email address is there, and you can also um, visit our website at ccsierracamp.org. Um, with that, we'll be sending out uh, to, to later today or tomorrow to all registrants of the webinar the slides as well as um, a recording of the presentation. And if you um, welcome any uh, comments or feedback, so thank it. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>